So I was perusing YouTube while eating, and I stumbled onto this channel with entrepreneurship video essays. Now my best friend Robert is a commercial entrepreneur, and I absolutely love making fun of the fact that he has absolutely no economics knowledge. Because the world doesn't base its money on gold anymore. In fact, money isn't really based on anything anymore. It's what's called fiat money. Money that's really nothing more than paper that the government says is money. Bankers have become the modern day alchemists with the ability to literally create money out of nothing. I think I'm just nitpicking, but it seems like the framing of this is already going to be from an anti-Keynesian, anti-fiat, and anti-central bank point of view. But since banks are businesses that are here to make money and that they only have to keep only 10% of the money they get in reserves, why would they just let your money sit there when it could be out collecting interest for them and making them money? So they lend out 90% of your money or $9,000 as a loan to Frank at a 5% interest rate so that Frank could start his door-to-door -door kitchen knife sales business. And what started out as $10,000 in the money supply has magically increased to $19,000. This kid's understanding isn't academically incorrect, albeit I think with purposefully obfuscated framing for the narrative, but it's more like everyone misunderstands banking on such a fundamental level that I think I'm going to have a hard time making this dunk under 20 minutes. I've said it before, you can be so wrong that in order to be corrected, you need to be taught multiple college courses of worth of content. Fundamentally, money now operates on supply and demand. There is no longer a real backing to currency. And now that might sound dangerous or otherwise unsavory, the only reason why gold was considered money was tradition. Do you think gold is money? No. From this chart of consumer price inflation back to 1800, we can see that consumer price inflation, and especially the monetary system, is more stable than it has ever been. Inflation isn't inherently bad. What is bad is unstable and unpredictable levels of inflation, which is why most central banks target between 1.5 and 3%. A moderate amount of inflation is generally considered to be a sign of a very healthy economy. As the economy grows, demand for goods and services increase. This increase in demand creates upward pressure on costs as suppliers try to keep up. Workers benefit from this economic growth as it drives increases in demand for labor, and as a result, wages increase. So let's talk about fractional reserve banking and what it is. So in fractional reserve banking, Banks over a certain amount of deposits must keep a certain percentage of those deposits on hand with the Federal Reserve or with the central bank. Pre-COVID, it would be changed a lot and was a monetary policy tool, but post-COVID, it's currently at 0%. Now, mind you, this isn't weird. Uh, it's an admittedly American-centric point of view on banking. Uh, the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada don't require reserves for any depository institutions. The effect of printing money is called the money multiplier. This effect notionally is boundless, and ignoring currency drains, we have ourselves a geometric series that mimics printing money. This is an intended effect of fractional reserve banking, but the effect is often overstated by economics textbooks and your average Google answer. The impact of the money multiplier is one that's broadly debated because of its vague nature. If you were looking at an older econ textbook, probably one before 1995, the money multiplier was more widely accepted as a stable figure to determine monetary expansion. But since 1995, banks no longer make the majority of their money on deposits. There's also the newer phenomena, such as the Federal Reserve introducing interest on reserves, QE, normalization policies, post-financial crisis, and what exactly happens in an economy when the federal funds rate moves toward the lower bound. So very simply, let's edit this example and make it more correct so that you understand the money multiplier before I talk more about monetary policy. So in order for these examples to make sense, we have to pretend that there is no money drain, there is no consideration of credit risk, there is no competition between institutions, and there are optimal macroeconomic forces at play. So let's say my girlfriend and I want to buy a house. Before we take out the loan, the economy looks something like this. We want that non-monetary asset, in this case, a house. So we go to the bank and we take out a mortgage. The bank deposits the money to us, and at the same time, we now owe them that money plus interest back. We now own the house, and the house seller has our deposit. They go and deposit it into their bank, and in turn, our bank transfers their money to their bank to settle this transaction. 
Now in real life, most banks hold an excess of reserves, billions of dollars more than what is required for this exact reason. But say they did dip into their reserves. That money didn't go anywhere, it's just now in the form of debt they hold. But the government requires a minimal amount of liquid reserves. So they would probably go out and borrow money from another bank, utilize the discount window, or they would attempt to retain new deposits before the end of the day to make up for that money they lost. Money did technically get multiplied here, but it had no quantifiable effect on the value of currency. So let's talk about the FFR and discount window, because these are very important parts of the monetary system. I'm not going to talk about things like interest on reserves, open market operations, or quantitative easing, because those are very, very dependent on country to country, and I have a few other bits of content on open market operations. The federal funds rate is the rate at which depositories lend to one another on an uncollateralized basis. In a very similar vein, the discount window is simply the rate at which banks are permitted to borrow from the Federal Reserve or the central bank itself. Usually it's set at 100 basis points higher than the federal funds rate to minimize its use. A similar measure is LIBOR, which is the London Interbank Overnight Rate, I think, maybe. This is the average of interbank interest rates in London. Uh, at which at least $350 trillion in derivatives and financial securities are tied to. And to see what this looks like in real life, the biggest public bank in the US right now is JP Morgan Chase. And in 2018 alone, they collected $77.44 billion in just interest alone. So here are some smaller little nitpicks I have. Uh, JP Morgan Chase also trades trillions of dollars a year in financial securities. Like, if you literally expand the fucking tab he was on, you can see that a lot of the income isn't exclusive to interest on consumer loans. Additionally, if you just Google the 10K and you look at their consumer credit portfolio and the commercial banking, you can see that very little of their interest income actually comes from any form of consumer interest on commercial banking products. Bank runs are almost inevitable with fractional reserve banking because at the end of the day, people are going to eventually want their money back. FDIC to guarantee people that if the bank can't give their deposits back to them, they'll be insured for up to $250,000 for each person at each bank. From their perspective, if depositors are always guaranteed by the government to get their money back, where is the incentive for banks to act ethically with their customers' money? So the FDIC only covers depository institutions, and investment banks are not depository institutions. So to say that the FDIC poses a moral hazard, I think is a bit of a stretch. The FDIC doesn't unconditionally back deposits. There are certain capital requirements, and if they fall under this requirement, the FDIC issues warnings and can step in to find a buyer for the bank without having to actually give any government money out. Additionally, there are tons of supervisory blocks and things such as premiums charged to the banks for the FDIC's existence. And this, these risk premiums are stored in an insurance fund to help pay out deposits if no buyer for the bank can be found. The taxpayer doesn't really foot the bill unless the entire commercial banking system were to collapse, which is unlikely to happen. Okay, I'm recording now for real. Give, record me an outro. No. But why not? It's really funny that you fucked it up the first time. <laughs> Why are you so mean to me? <laughs> uh, motherfucker, I'm embroidering right now.